Okay, good evening, everybody, and welcome to Books and Books in Coral Gables. Thank you all for coming down tonight for this special presentation. Uh, as you can see from these cameras and these lights, we're live streaming this event on the internet tonight, so a message for our internet audience at home. If at any time during the presentation you'd like to purchase a copy of the book, you can call the number on your screen. Uh, we'll get it signed for you, and we will ship it to you wherever you are in the United States free of charge. Uh, for those of you who are watching overseas, the shipping charge might be just a little bit more. The, well, this evening, Books and Books is very happy to welcome Mr. David Lee and his new book, The World as Garden, The Life and Writings of David Fairchild. Mr. Lee is Professor Emeritus in the Department of Biological Sciences at Florida International University. He is a specialist in the biology of tropical plants and has also served as the director of the Kampong, David Fairchild's old home in Coconut Grove. In this book, he brings us an anthology of the writings of David Fairchild, one of the most important figures in American agriculture and science in the first half of the 20th century. These writings, from books, articles, unpublished letters, and manuscripts, are arranged to describe the chronology of events in his life his love for plants and nature, and affection for family and friends. Here to tell us more about it, please give a very warm welcome to Mr. David Lee. All righty, thank you. Thank you. Um, this is a local book by a local author in a great bookstore. Uh, I was here actually just a little bit before this bookstore opened. That's when we moved to Miami. Um, all right. Here we go. So, David Fairchild uh, is a, an important figure in the history of uh, Miami. Uh, he's, a, he's also a very important figure in the history of American agriculture. He, uh, he established the Plant Introduction Service for the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and in, during his time introduced over 200,000 varieties and, and new species of plants that transformed American agriculture. Uh, the service that he left today has a, established a germplasm collection of about 550,000 accessions. And that's the diversity, the genetic diversity up, upon which our agriculture is established. So. I, no, no figure has had more inf influence on the improvement of American agriculture than David Fairchild. Um, he was also uh, a very important uh, person in the early history of Miami. He first visited Miami in 1898. Uh, he bought his property in 1916, and, and they lived frequently in a house on the property. And then they built the great house uh, that we know of. We, frequently called the Kampong House today, uh, in 1938. Uh, he was also uh, an early uh, board president of the University of Miami, so he was influential in the development of the young university. He was uh, the president of the Tropical Everglades Association, that was a local association that fought to establish Everglades National Park, and he wrote the, the critical scientific treatise that was used uh, widely and republished many times that was a scientific justification for the park. So he was a very important figure in the history of Everglades National Park. He also established or helped establish four very important garden institutions in Miami. You all know about Fairchild Tropical Botanic Garden. Uh, he didn't establish it himself, but it was established in, from his inspiration and his honor. But he, he had an informal influence on the development of the garden when he was alive. Of course, the Kampong, his home, which became a really wonderful garden, he established it, and it's, a, it's not the size of the garden of Fairchild, but it's the most beautiful place in Miami, the Kampong. If you haven't been there, it's a place to visit. Um, he also established, uh, through his position at uh, USDA, the Chapman Field, which is a subtropical horticulture research station in Miami. It's been at its present location since 1923. The first garden was established in 1898 which was in, on Brickell Avenue. And then finally, uh, he was not the establisher of it, but he was a very close friend of the uh, 
of the couple that established what is now known as the Montgomery Botanical Center, and he had an influence on the selection of species in the early garden. So four institutions. So he's had a, a big influence in, uh, in Miami. So I'd like to say a little bit about the dedication of the book. I can't actually read this now, but uh, you can read it. Um, what I really am dedicating the book are to those people who are keeping the legacy, the memory of David Fairchild alive, and that includes members of, of his family um, and people who have written about the history of David Fairchild. And I want to mention uh, uh, two people. They're, they're in the photograph with me there. One of them is David uh, Jones, who is uh, writing about the history of David now, and Helen Pankost, his uh, granddaughter, who's with us this evening, right there. And uh, Helen is a... Uh, as a granddaughter of David Fairchild, I actually spent a lot of time with David and Marion uh, as she was a child growing up, either living in a house on their grounds or living in their, eventually in a home nearby. And I wouldn't have been able to do this book without Helen. Not only did she help with the copyright uh, fees and so forth, but she gave me the feeling for what David Fairchild was like and Marion Fairchild were like together. And I, I wouldn't have been able to choose the text to produce the chronology of this book without without Helene's help. So, a little bit about the family. Now, the, there's a lot of, I'm gonna show you photographs. Partly, you know, uh, if I were a writer, I would just say, well, my words will be just good enough. But I'm a biologist, and biologists cannot hardly say a word without showing a picture. <laughs> so that's the way we are. So uh, I will, s but the pictures I'm showing you are, are pictures that are uh, almost without exception in the book. And there's about 100 photographs in the book. And uh, many of them have not been published before. So they're in, either in archive, archives, but they just haven't been printed. So, so that's a, thing, a feature of the book that makes it uh, special. And those are uh, David and Mary. Those, that's, those are David Fairchild's uh, parents, uh, George and Charlotte. Uh, they married uh, when they were students at Oberlin College. And uh, the story is that well, Grandison Fairchild, who is the, the father of the, the Fairchild clan, uh, moved the family from Massachusetts to uh, the wilds of Ohio in the early part of the 19th century. And then Grandison Fairchild uh, was instrumental in the establishment of Oberlin College. He was a minister. Oberlin was, a, was, a, was founded by the church, I think Presbyterian Church. He was influential in that, and then they lived near the, near the college. And so when George was going to school, living at home, Charlotte came from New York State. Now you got to realize this, realize this about Oberlin College is that it was the only college where women could could get admitted, and it was the only college where uh, blacks could go to school. And so Charlotte was in school there, and they met in the in the house, and they fell in love, and they married, and and they went to start their family and to start his career. And. Uh, they went to, oh, a little bit about the family now, yes. Uh, so there were three sons that became university presidents or college presidents. And then there was, and those, so these were two of them, and then were David's uncles. Then he had another uncle from, through, his, through his mother uh, who became an eminent uh, scientist, well, not a university president, but a very eminent scientist. So he came from a scholarly family, and he spent most of his childhood on college campuses. And so it's a nice thing that Grandison Fairchild, who was a minister, said about his sons, he said, too bad they didn't make it all the way. <laughs> so they became college presidents, but they didn't could become full-time ministers. He was a little bit disappointed, but probably fairly proud of them. So that was a family that uh, influenced him in, in his career. And his, he was born on the campus of... Uh, of the Michigan State Agricultural College, which is now, of course, Michigan State University. It was the first of the land-grant institutions that was established. It was the first agricultural university in the, in the country. And uh, George was, a, was hired as an English professor in the college. And eventually, he uh, had some role in administration and was even the acting president for a short period of time. It was a very small place, and uh, everyone knew each other. And it was also a place that had recently been carved out of the woods of of Michigan, so there was lots of natural history right there on campus. And I just want to read a little bit uh, from this experience on that campus. Living as we did on the campus, we children grew up among the professors. Occasionally, they, they even joined in our investigations of brook and forest. 
W.J. William J. Beale, a gentle Quaker, was professor of botany and possessed amazing patience and thoroughness. To determine their length of life, he buried seeds of cereals and vegetables in labeled bottles, digging them up every 10 years to test their power of germination. Occasionally, one reads newspaper accounts of mummy wheat taken from Egyptian tombs 3,000 years old. According to these tales, when it is planted today, not only it not only grows but produces extraordinary yields. These stories are without foundation. Yet on such, some such yarn, William Jennings Bryan based one of his most popular sermons on immortality. His daughter, Ruth Bryan Owen, now Mrs. Rohde, told me that the sermon was even reproduced on a Victrola record. Be that as it may, Professor Beale's prolonged experiment, experiment determined that grains of wheat lose their power of germination in less than 25 years, and many other seeds lose theirs in a much shorter period of time. Professor Beale was a born investigator and was one of the first men to stress the advantage of planting only selected strains of trees and vegetables. It's hard to realize that the idea of plant selection was so novel 60 years ago that he wrote a paper on the subject for one of the early horticultural meetings in Michigan. One of the most outstanding students at the college in those days was my mother's brother, Byron D. Halstead, who later played an important part in my life. He came often to our house, and I remember his excitement over his new microscope as vividly as I remember the thrilling old new world visible through its lens. Uncle Byron left Michigan to work under Dr. William G. Farlow of Harvard, studying microscopic fungi. Dr. Farlow had but recently written the first accurate description of a destructive plant disease to be published in this country. So now, when he was 10 years old, sorry, I get this to work here, oops, okay. When, uh, the, when he was 10 years old, uh, George was offered the presidency of the Kansas State Agricultural College in, in Manhattan, Kansas. Uh, he writes about the shock that the family had when they arrived from the, from the verdant uh, forest of uh, central Michigan to the grasslands of uh, central Kansas and the dust that filtered through the house, the bitterly cold winters, the howling winds. Uh, his mother had a hard time dealing with it, but eventually they uh, grew to love the place. And uh, <clears throat> there's a picture there in the lower left of, uh, you can see George in the, on the bottom, and then in the upper left, third from the top, is, uh, is another uh, very important influence in David Fairchild, and that was uh, William uh, Kellerman. And so those three, three people I've just mentioned then, uh, Beale and Halstead and uh, Kellerman, were the, they were the scientific uh, mentors for uh, David Fairchild's development. Later on, uh, uh, after he graduated from uh, Kansas State University at the age of 19 with a bachelor's degree in agriculture, uh, he went with his uncle who was a professor at Iowa State and worked in his lab. And then very quick soon after that, his uncle was hired by Rutgers University, got a big promotion, and he worked at Rutgers the rest of his life. And so uh, David went with him as a graduate student. So these people, many, many years later, they continued to have an influence on him through, through correspondence and seeing them at, from time to time. And so these were, these were his mentors. However, when he was at uh, Rutgers uh, working in his uncle's laboratory, he had a, re a visit by Beverly Galloway, who was a, a newly appointed head of uh, what was the plant pathology section in the Bureau of Plant Industry at uh, USDA. And Galloway hired him away from uh, Halstead's lab and David accepted it, and he became a research uh, scientist within, the, within his group. They called them themselves the boys, and they worked in an attic in one of the bu buildings in, uh, in D.C. And he had a quite a, a, a successful short career of four years of working on plant diseases and published papers and uh, really made a real success of himself. But William Kellerman uh, got his Ph.D. in Germany. And I think he planted the seed in David that it would be a really great idea for him to, if he really wanted to learn and get a, a, a dissertation finished, to go to Europe and go to labs, do a rotation in different labs, and then choose a project and finish his, his PhD there. And so uh, he, after four years, resigned from the USDA and went to, uh, went to Europe to study. And uh, those are the places where he worked. He started off at the Naples Zoological Station, occupying the Smithsonian table at the station. And then he went to Breslau, he went to Berlin, uh, Munster, and Bonn, all these universities. And he worked with some of the great bot botanical luminaries uh, 
of the world that were working in, in Germany. Uh, one of them is illustrated here. That's Simon Schwindener, who was a, an expert on plant, plant biomechanics. By the way, Schwindener was also the person that discovered the lichen symbiosis. You know, we think of lichens as being this partnership between an alga and a fungus. Well, it, in the 19th century, people didn't have any idea about this. And it was Schwindener that made that discovery. So he was a, a notable guy. Uh, apparently, however, uh, David wasn't too thrilled with his uh, lectures in biomechanics because he had enough time. Even though he wrote uh, German quite well, he had enough time to make a nice sketch of Schwindener when he was given his lecture. So I put the picture of a formal portrait. You can see that's a pretty good likeness that he drew there. So I'm not sure how much of uh, biomechanics he learned, but he could study from his notes. He was, uh, well, Helen tells me that, uh, I mean, he was, he was fluent in writing and reading German, but his, he had a terrible Midwestern accent, which he never was able to get over. And so uh, that led to his meeting with Melchior Treub, who was a, was a uh, Belgian uh, scientist who uh, established the uh, Foreigner's Laboratory at the Colonial Gardens, the Dutch Colonial Gardens, and now in Bogor at the time were called Wittenzorg. And he had established something called the Foreigner's Laboratory, which is people, young scientists from all over Europe would, uh, would study there. And they really sort of established a, a school of, uh, of science, what's called physiological plant anatomy. It was the, sort of the reconciliation between plant structure and function. And so that, that work was done in his laboratory. And so it was a pretty exciting time. But David chose to work on the, on the barely understood relationship between termites and fungi. And he got a great start on that. It's still a hot place of research. Now they're doing a, using molecular techniques, working it out. But so he made a lot of progress on it, and uh, was well on his way to completing his dissertation. Had a great time in Java, and there's lots of really vivid descriptions of his stay there in this in this book. And then, however, uh, his life changed. On his trip to uh, over the ocean to uh, to Europe, he met uh, Barbara Lathrop who was a, a wealthy former journalist that come into his family inheritance and spent his life traveling the world, interested in plants, but traveling the world. And he, he took an interest in the young Fairchild, visited him in Naples, and in Naples he said, he said, uh, you should go to the tropics, I think something like that. And he said, well, I don't have the money to do that. I'd like to go to Java, but I don't have the money. He said, I'm going to give you $1,000. He put it in a bank in, in London for him to tap when he was ready. He said, you'd use that money to go to, uh, to Java and do your studies. Now, $1,000, this is 1897. That was a lot of money. That's like $18,000 or something like that. So he, he did. He took that money and he went to Java to study. And so then uh, Lathrop then followed him. So he met him in Naples, and then he followed him to Java and he, he, with, a, with his retinue. And he, and spent some time with him. David took them around a little bit. And then he said to David, he said, I'm tired of traveling with all these people. Why don't just you and I go on a trip together? We can see. I can show you some things and, uh, about traveling. And you can, we can see some plants. And so that's what they did. And I'm going to read uh, a little section of that. Uh, there was a, Lathrop was a pretty, uh, was a pretty prickly personality. I'm not sure that I, I could actually describe it. But he could be, uh, he could be pretty tough to deal with. Anyway, uh, they started their trip, and I'm going to take it up from Padang, which is a beautiful town on the west coast of uh, Sumatra. So from Padang on the west coast of Sumatra, we pushed up to Fort de Kock on the interior in the Kluf von Aero, where 13 waterfalls cascade over gray cliffs lush with tropical verdure. I lag behind, intent on my collecting. Landscapes and waterfalls would not go into my bottles, nor could I take them home to study them. After waiting an hour for me, Mr. Lathrop returned somewhat irate. He found me where he had left me, still gathering termites. There ensued a rather heated dialogue between us, which almost sent me back to Buitenzorg. If you're going to travel with me, I'll show you the world, but you can't stop every minute and collect specimens, or you won't get any general idea of the countries we traveled through, said Mr. Lathrop. From that time on, I tried to sandwich my biology between other experiences of travel. Mr. Lathrop was not a collector at heart, and remonstrated about my vials of dead insects. No one would ever need so many of a kind, he said. This sounded like heresy to me. I was a candidate for curator of, micro curator of microscopic fungi in the National Museum, and as a matter of fact, hold that position to this day. 
It was a great surprise to Mr. Lathrop to find that I had voyaged halfway around the world without knowing what he called the first principles of traveling. He tried to round out my meager education, but I could not see any sense in dressing up and learning the endless rules of etiquette. On the day before Christmas, we sighted Kota Raja, which is right on the northern tip of the Sumatra. I had just finished a long, reassuring letter to my mother telling her that, although I was so far away, I had never seen a serious accident of any kind. As I sealed the letter, a native steward climbed from a hatch close by. Suddenly, another steward gave him a kick and ran, and I heard a shout, Amok! 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 The two stewards grappled with each other on the stairway, one with a hatchet and the other with a knife. The cry rang out again, and the struggling pair fell headlong into Mr. Lathrop's cabin. The captain and Mr. Lathrop reached the scene simultaneously, pulled the combats out by, combatants out by the legs as another steward appeared and wiped the blood off the baggage. I opened my mother's letter, and I added a postscript. Mr. Lathrop and I spent Christmas Day in Kota Raja. We were not allowed to go outside the town, but were interested in seeing the blockhouses and barbed wire entanglements constructed by the, touch, the Dutch to assist in their warfare with the fierce wild h &E's, those untamed savage people of North Sumatra. They're still a problem today. This was one of the first occasions when barbed wire was thus used. New Year's Eve found us off the limits of the little island of Penang, a Catholic priest was on board, a man of great refinement who had a garden of his own and a fine collection of orchids. Mr. Lathrop and I talked with him well into the evening about tropical horticulture. When the priest bade us good night, I followed Mr. Lathrop to his cabin, and he began to lay before me his ideas of what a botanist could do if he were given an opportunity to travel and collect the native vegetables, fruits, drug plants, grains, and all the other types of useful plants as yet unknown in America. I cannot recall the conversation exactly, but I know that when the clock struck 12 and the new year of 1897 began, I had promised Mr. Lathrop that I would take up the study of the plants useful to man and, together with him, find a way to introduce their culture into America. It was a rather vague, ill-defined agreement, but it was a turning point. From that time on, I began to pay attention to the economic plants around me and to work with Mr. Lathrop on a scheme for a botanic garden which we thought should be started in the Hawaiian Islands. So his whole career changed. He dropped his scientific research, uh, the pure scientific research of, of termites and fungi, and he took up a very practical horticultural research of introducing plants and did it for the rest of his life. But he always had a little bit of uh, wistfulness about the days and those studies, and some regret, a little bit of regret about it. So now, uh, they, they traveled for many months together, and then they came back to the United States, and uh, David Fairchild wrote his job. He wrote the treatise for the introduction of plants to American agriculture, and uh, presented it to the Secretary of Agriculture and became the director. So he wrote his job description, and he got the job. But soon after that, uh, Barbara Lathrop came to him and said, you know, this, this bureaucratic stuff is not for you. We've got to go. You've got to show them what really this, this program can do. He says, I want you to travel with me throughout the world and collect plants and bring them back to the United States. So David Fairchild went to the Secretary, Secretary of Agriculture, explained the situation to him. He was not a happy camper, to the Secretary, but he let him do it. And later on, he agreed that it had been a wise decision, that it had been well worth it. So they went, they traveled, they brought this, collected this stuff, brought it back to the United States. They, he had a, they had the office started, so they received the material and planted it out, and distributed it, and so forth. And then in, uh, in, two, in 1903, he came back, finished with his travels with Lathrop, and took up the position as uh, the director of the, what was then called the Section on Foreign Plant and Seed Introduction. And it was when he came back that he met Alexander Graham Bell and he met his daughter, Marion. And they fell for each other very quickly. I think the first time they met. And uh, in 1905, they got married. And uh, very soon after that, they started to uh, grow their family. So the picture's here. Alexander Graham Bell in the upper left, who, was, uh, who he was very close with and had a, a tremendous influence on David until he passed away in 1922. 
And uh, there is his marriage, his wedding. And then on the lower, the, the right side is the family. We're looking at four generations. His first uh, child, uh, Graham or Sandy, uh, his wife, uh, his mother-in-law, and his grandmother. Her, her grandmother, not his, but her grandmother together. This, was a, this had a tremendous effect on David. Um, the family, the inclusiveness of the family, the connections with his, uh, his brother-in-law, who was uh, uh, Milton Grosvenor, and his connection to the National Geographic Society, his writing articles for the National Geographic, and, and plus his colleagues that wrote articles. So he had a big effect on the magazine and presentation of plants and cultures in the magazine. And it made, helped make him a, a very well-known person in American society as the National Geographic became, under Grosvenor's direction, the most popular magazine in the country. Uh, also, uh, there was a connection to the American Association of Academy, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, that, uh, Gro uh, that, uh, that Graham Bell was, uh, Alexander Graham Bell was a, was a supporter of, and his father-in-law. So this family, and, and Marion then basically gave him guidance, connected him to people, was his editor, uh, took away his rough edges, made him a much more, I think it made him able to express his true nature. He's a very nice, kindly person in a more confident way in his life. So it had a dramatic effect on him. There's a picture of them together. So the Grosvenors and the Fairchilds, they both, they had, well, the Grosvenors had lots of kids. The Fairchilds had three children, two daughters and a son. But they were all together, mixed ages, and they, and they hung out with each other uh, in Washington, D.C. And then later on, uh, they hung out with each other in Coconut Grove. They still hang out with each other. They do it in Canada now. So uh, it was an amazing family, and it was really... The glue, I mean, the, it was just Alexander Graham Bell insisted the, on that support and, and the inclusiveness in the family. And he just drew, drew it together. And it still exists. So there's a picture of, uh, of David uh, with his uh, newly established office. There's his staff around 1915. There he is in his office. Uh, and the really, so you had all this infrastructure to make sure that the plants that came back to the United States were well taken care of, germinated, sent to the right places where they might survive. But the, what really made it go is that he, he was able to recruit the collectors to could go under very difficult circumstances to different parts of the world and collect the plants and process them properly so they'd make it back to the United States with a chance of surviving. And so two of the more important collectors are the lower right hand, and there's uh, descriptions of them in the book. On the lower left, we have uh, Hank Meyer, who was a Dutchman that uh, worked for David until he vanished on the Yangtze River. At the peak of his powers, he just vanished during the political instability of, of China as a, just the collapse of, uh, of the political order. And they never saw him again. They never saw any trace of him. Uh, the person on the right is Joseph Rock, who worked uh, through financial support from his office for a period of time. And then when it was clear that Rock was too expensive because he had a bunch of bandits rent with him because he went to really difficult places. So if he's going to be conquered by bandits, he had to have his own bandits to defend him. And then he had, you know, he had uh, China. He had uh, good silverware and a nice table setting, and he had a little rubber bath, bathtub he would use, and so forth. So he, he was expensive. So David was able to get him support through the National Geographic Society, uh, and he was actually the chair of the Explore committee on exploration for a while as well, which didn't hurt. And then uh, he also got him support through the Arnold Arboretum. So. And then, of course, uh, Joseph Rock became a prolific writer for the National Geographic. He wrote many, many articles. He was an amazing guy, a linguist, an anthropologist, and a botanist, all r rolled into one. And so there is a picture of him on the lower right. So these people, really, they brought the plants in, and the, just the tens of thousands of different varieties started rolling in, being processed. Now I'll talk a little bit about food. So. And I've got a picture about food, and then I've got a little thing on uh, controversy. You got to. I'm going to read something that he he wrote a really great article in uh, the Atlantic Monthly when he was in retirement. But so it wasn't just about food, but I mean it wasn't just about plants for David Fairchild because all these societies where he collected the plants, they used the plants, they processed them, they used them in their cuisines, and so in order to appreciate the use utility of the plants, he had to appreciate 
the cultures in which those plants were utilized, what kind of spices they used, what was the, you know, how could you, how could you make these things taste good? How could you process them so they were no longer poisonous, so on and so forth? And so, so what it meant then, in a sense, was that when he introduced the plant, he was introducing the knowledge about the plant. So he was, was introducing a lot of foreign culture into the United States. There was a lot of resistance to this. And so he, he battled his whole life trying to get people to eat new foods. And I would have to say, you, when I read this little part from, the, from this article in, the, in, in Atlantic Monthly, you'll, maybe you'll agree with me a little bit. I think he was the, he's the patron saint of the foodie movement. <laughs> so now, now we're into the middle of that moment, you know, and so exotic foods are the, they're the, the order of the day, right? So, but when David Fairchild was active, they were not. I mean, people ate potatoes and they ate beef and carrots maybe, you know, not much. So. So uh, let me, uh, I'm used to actually being able to see a screen when I do this. I have to squint at the screen down there, but uh, here we go. Okay, so food here is on page 254, okay. And I'll shorten this a little bit. So, yeah, 254. So in the beginning of this article, he sort of describes his life, his relationship to Barbara Lathrop, all their travels. And then he says, now, 40 years have passed, and I have been asked by a Boston editor to give an account of the strange foods, such as those he tasted at our, at our table in Coconut Grove, out under the big ficus tree. So there you see a group right there at his house, eating probably some exotic food that he's brought in from somewhere and get people to eat. And maybe they didn't want to eat them at all, or maybe they tried it. Maybe they put it under the table, who knows? Uh, Helene would tell me that uh, if kids didn't like the food that, he, that they had at the table, he'd say, well, put some sugar on it. <laughs> and then they would eat it. So uh, his visit reminds me of another editor's luncheon I attended when I was the guest of the late Walter Hines Page and his partner, F.N. Doubleday, at Garden City, Long Island, big publishers. I was trying to stir up interest in dasheens, and had sent some ahead for this meal. The cook had served them well, and all the editors tasted them. Some said they were fine, some said they were inferior to potatoes, and some, seeing that they were covered with fibers, called them bearded potatoes. Mr. Page declared he liked them, and I left the table comforted, although not much encouraged. It makes a lot of difference what adject adjectives you use. My friend and co-worker Robert Young and I decided we should work out some recipes for this new root vegetable. We burned much midnight oil preparing advertising signs. We wrote descriptive accounts of the dasheen and took hundreds of attractive photographs of a field of dasheens in West Florida, of the tu tubers alone, and of the delicious-looking finished products such as dasheen chips, baked dasheen, masked dasheen, and dasheens used for turkey stuffing. We were ahead of the times with our photographic representations of the foods pleasantly served. But with all our enthusiasm, we ran, in, we ran on into the impossibility of describing the flavor of this thing, which we held admiringly in our hands. What is a dasheen, anyhow, people would ask. When we tried to tell our listeners, they looked at us with a vacant stare. Oh, it's just a kind of potato, they would conclude. But it has a different taste, we would insist. Is it better? They would retort, well, perhaps not better, but different. It has a nutty flavor. Who wants a nutty flavor in his potatoes? I don't. And there the conversation came to a standstill. Drat them, we thought. We have made up their, they have made up their minds to dislike our dashin before they have even tasted it. And at that time, there was no radio, no radio chant available. Dashins! Why not try the delicious dashins with which to overcome that distaste? It made no difference that the dasheen was the delicious vegetable upon which whole populations depend for their daily meal. It still is no better known in the United States than our Indian corn is known in Ireland or France, and no more appreciated, let me add. So that was his battle his whole life, was to get people, to bring, that's not enough just to bring the plants in, their new plants or new crops. You gotta get people to try them and like them. And that was what he did his whole life. So he's the patron saint of the foodie movement. That's Southeast Asian. That's a that's a taro. 
Uh, okay, so there's a picture of the food here. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the controversy that he overcame, and in a way it's related to the food, and that is that bringing in crops brings in culture. And, uh, and, and at the time he was doing this after, uh, this is like in the teens and 20s, there was a lot of resistance among uh, Americans to uh, immigrant ideas, foods, flavors, and so forth. I mean, there was, a, there, was a, there was a xenophobia, and if it came from Asia, it was even worse. And so, actually, uh, Congress had passed the legislation that was the Plant Quarantine Act, which made it very difficult to introduce plants. There was a whole process you had to go through. And it turned out that, uh, I'm not going to read, I'm not enough time for me to read this little part in the book, but his old friend, Charles Marlett, who was the best man at his wedding, who he knew as a child in Kansas, uh, as an entomologist, was actually the head of the committee that approved the plants. And so these two old friends became professional enemies within the USDA. And, uh, but their wives were friends, and they sort of kept it together. They remained sort of friends their whole lives. They died within a couple of months of each other in 1954. But it's an interesting story. And uh, it was a, so he had a lot of challenges, uh, and there was some controversy that related to his work. Oops, okay. Uh, you know, reflecting on his own experiences in nature and then seeing his children, and then particularly his grandchildren in nature, he started to think more about the value of, nature, of the experience in nature for the proper upbringing and education of children. And he wrote quite a bit about it uh, in, in his retirement. And uh, there's a, actually, uh, this photograph here has two pictures of Helen Pankost in it. One of them is a child in a Fairchild Tropical Garden in the left side. Is that with your mom or your... Okay, and then uh, Helene is the one with braids in the picture with David Fairchild giving out uh, hand lenses to the children at a party. And uh, Helene is telling me that one of the friends that was at this hand lens party is coming to visit, stay with you tomorrow? Yeah. That's great. So I'd like to read a little, uh, a little statement about uh, education and, and hand lenses here from, uh, from David Fairchild here. Okay, 228, yes, okay. Just a short little piece here. I couldn't have been more than eight years old when as, as a, one of a group of mischievous boys hiding behind the spruce trees of a college campus in Michigan, I watched my uncle, Byron D. Halstead, open a little mail package in which he thought he would find the eagerly awaited hand lens he had ordered, his first one. Instead, he found only a matchbox full of earthrooms, which we had arranged as a surprise for him. We scampered, but he caught us and spanked us soundly, for he was disappointed. I am immensely grateful to him, though, for when his lens did arrive, he took me by the hand and through the door and into the incredibly fascinating world of the creatures which are hard to see, letting me peek through this, his lens at all sorts of living objects. Ten years later, I was in his sunny laboratory in North Hall at Ames, Iowa. I was watching pollen grains of buckwheat germinate in sugar solutions and was having an unforgettable experience. In the buckwheat fields nearby, with my hand lens, I had studied the different flowers and gathered both the short stamens and the long ones from which to sow the pollen grains in the sugar solution on my glass microscope slides. I cannot remember when I began to carry my, in my pocket my own hand lens, a Coddington, as they were called then. I know that I was 17 years old. I was 17 when Swingle and I began our study of tumbleweeds, which piled up against the barbed wire fences on the plains of Kansas, and I carried a lens then. Probably I lost several of them as I did my jackknives, and there were periods when I did not have one, but as the habit grew on me of wanting to see more than my own eyes could show me, I felt lost if I did not have my pocket microscope in my pocket. I recall Mr. Brian Lathrop, my patron's brother, once raising his eyebrows and saying to me as we drove up a mountainside in Java, what? No knife? A full-grown man without a jackknife? How does that happen? But I had my hand lens in my pocket, even though I had lost my knife. Fifty years have gone by, and in my trouser pocket, I can feel my leather-covered hand lens, the one which has been with me constantly around the world and 
through the jungles and gardens of the Far East. Through it I have peered at a great many beautiful objects, fascinating, often superbly fascinating, and I do not recall seeing anything ugly through my little window. I think ugliness must somehow be a man-made thing. Even the scum of a mud hole does not appear ugly if you examine it through a microscope. <laughs> and uh, he tried to get children to have the same excitement that he had in his life. Now, uh, towards the end of his work at the USDA, he, he was uh, rehired and, well, he went on full-time in 2003, and then uh, he actually stopped working in, uh, intensively as the director of, uh, of, the, of the section of 1923, and then he traveled on the Utawana. No, it was 25, he, I think he stopped working. Well, he worked at, he went to the Panama, but so around that time, and then he uh, went on a trip on the Utuana. Uh, it was uh, funded by Allison Armour, a wealthy industrialist from Chicago, and they, they traveled uh, th throughout many parts of the tropics. And uh, so he, d not on the ship, but uh, uh, as part of that expedition, he went to, uh, to uh, the Asian tropics. And there's a picture of him there. And then in 1940, when he had been retired in, the, in South Florida, they made this final trip, this great expedition on the Cheng Ho, uh, with the uh, support of Ann Archbold. And that was a trip to the eastern uh, Indonesia that culminated in a visit to Ambon as the, as the uh, Germans invaded Holland, and then he had to go back. But uh, so there's great descriptions from those trips in the book. And then uh, this brings us to Miami. So uh, Miami, uh, he had visited Miami 1898, 1912, uh, he and Marion came back in 1916, and I'll, I'll read a little part of, the, of their experience then. And then they lived uh, in a house in the Kampong in the winters from 1916 up to the construction of the old, the main house, the Kampong house today, which was built in 1928. And then from 28 on, they lived, other than these trips, they lived in Miami full, pretty much full time until his death in 1954 and her death in 1962. So it was a long, they were in Miami a long time. But I wanna, what I want to do is uh, just read to you the experience they had of, uh, of first coming to, to uh, Miami with together, it's 205, yeah, okay. So in February 1916, Marianne came again to Florida with her father and mother. They motored from St. Augustine to Palm Beach, going only about 40 miles each day. As the narrow brick road, often only wide enough for one car at a time, was very rough and made the trip a tiring one. They were all good travelers, and they enjoyed the primitive little hotels, which were their usual stopping places. In fact, I think they much preferred them to the Breakers in Palm Beach, where I had joined them, or to the old Royal Palm Hotel in Miami. The long corridors and the crowds of tourists in rocking chairs sitting on its eternal porches had no charm for any of us. And when Mr. and Mrs. Bell went north, Marion and, Marion and I were delighted to accept once more Mr. and Ms. Mrs. Simmons' invitations to stay with them. The Simmons were the, they, they ran the introduction garden in Miami, so they stayed in a rather modest house, but they had an extra room for them. And so they could be nearer the plants and further from the swarms of humans. It was this stay in the garden that converted Marion to the idea that she wanted a place in Florida, in the hammock region of it, the region of Coconut Grove, south of Miami. At first, the idea was a vague longing to stay on as time for leaving approached. Then we discussed the question, why shouldn't we buy a place? Neither of, neither of us could stand the late winter climate of Washington. Too many times we had discovered that if we wanted to go on living, we must avoid the February thaws, those trying periods in February and March when the temperature rises to summer heat and drops back into the lap of a si Siberian winter, sounds like this winter, spelling death to many species of plants as well as to hosts of delicate human beings. My keenest interest was in tropical plants anyway, and there was a probability that I might be able to work more and more with them and less and less in search after the hardier and more drought-resistant plants for the farmers who believed that a rigorous climate was necessary for the building of sterling character. I think we voiced some of our questionings to Professor Charles Torrey Simpson, to whose home, the Sentinels, we often went to see his collection of tropical plants, the largest in South Florida at that time, for he spread the news that the Fairchilds were looking for a place. 
The afternoon of our last day, when we were feeling particularly sorry for ourselves at having to leave, Mrs. Nugent, whom we knew slightly as a woman who loved plants and had a property on the Bayfront, drove her car, drove up to the house and asked if we would like to look at a place she had for sale in Coconut Grove. We got in her car and drove down under the great ficus trees that shaded the main highway. We passed half-kept or half-abandoned groves with weather-beaten houses and turned in through a tumble-down gate into a narrow trail of white limestone rock shaded in place with some seedling mango trees and grapefruit trees in bearing. Past a stone barn we drove and up a slight rise which had shut out the view ahead. Pink oleanders against the blue water, white clouds, a flock of gulls, sailboats going by. We stopped near a little weathered house with its roof sloping towards the sea. A mahogany tree, a poinciana, some yuccas, a small seedling mango tree, and a fine old sea grape, out, sea grape outlined the circle we were about to we were to turn about in. Mrs. Nugent stopped her car. Marion gazed a moment at the blue waters of the bay, noted some royal palms near, near a canal, glanced at the house with its tangle of vines over the porch, and said very simply, and in a strangely decided way, we've got to have this place, David. That was it. But you haven't the money, Marion, I replied. I'll ask Mother to advance the money on my inheritance. She ran. She had Alexander Graham Bell didn't do any finance. He was an inventor. She took care of the finances of the family. So I don't care. We just have to have this place. Mrs. Nugent, will you give us an option on it? I'm going back to Washington tonight, and I will wire you within 10 days. That was it. That was the camp on. And uh, then later, they, they started coming. They stayed in that little house. It was built by Albion Simmons. and. 1902, replaced the old stone house that was burned in a fire, and, and then they built the great house that we know today. So there's the, the house as they built it in 1928. Uh, the picture on the lower left is an earlier picture. It's probably about 1918. that shows Barbara Lathrop and Alexander Graham Bell with the Fairchilds, but there's the house on the lower right. And that brings us to the end. I'm going to read a little thing at the end that uh, it's actually my writing, but it's really a result of having talked to, to Helene and also her brother, uh, Hugh, who was very helpful as well. During the final decade of David Fairchild's life, he was slowed by gradually increasing circulatory problems that limited his, his mobility and his overall health. Yet he retained his curiosity about nature and his plants, and he worked in his office almost daily using his microscope and keeping up with correspondence. He continued to write extensively about plants, contributing to the occasional contributions of Fairchild Tropical Garden and to its bulletin when it began its publication in 1945. His motto of push on was never more relevant in this final stage of life. His daily routine consisted of early coffee and conversation with Marion, a swim in the pool, and a light breakfast. Mornings included some time in the laboratory and time examining his beloved plants, followed by lunch and a siesta. Afternoons often included visits by friends. Towards the end of his life, he no longer could write letters, but Marion served as a capable typist in producing his responses to the continuing correspondence. In those days, you know, people would write like 15, 20 letters a day, and then they would get 15 or 20 letters. So it was like a little bit like emails today, except they didn't get a bunch of advertisements. So anyway, she, I'm not going to read the letter, but there was a letter from, uh, he wrote a, a response to his old friend Joseph Rock, the plant explorer, and uh, there was a discussion in, in that, and I, just to give it, he, he responded after reading the, after sending the letter, it was a, I was aware that uh, Fairchild knew a lot from the letter. You could see that he was aware of the splitting tendencies of Hawaiian senior taxonomist Harold St. John, so there's too many species names in the Hawaiian flora. And uh, here and near the end of his life, he was still seeking out new plants for our gardens in South Florida. Just a few months later, this is 1954, while sitting among family and friends, in fact, just, just a few months after the pictures of the family and David Fairchild and Marion on the right there, just two or three months after that, the picture was, those pictures were taken by uh, Clara Farkas, who's still alive. 
Um, a few months later, while sitting among family and friends in his beloved home, he quietly slipped into a coma. They just became aware that he was no longer with them. And so they very gently moved him into a nearby bedroom, and he passed away a few days later, August 6, 1954. After his death, Marianne wrote a bit of Swinburne's poem, The Garden of Proserpine, on a piece of paper and passed it to the children. We thank with brief thanksgiving, whatever gods may be, that no man lives forever, that dead men rise up never, that even the warriest river winds somewhere safe to see. Marion lived on at the Kampong, helped to dedicate David Fairchild Elementary School the following year, and frequently visited with the school children there. She heard the children sing their school song in memory of David Fairchild, which they continue to sing to this day. David Fairchild's the school for me. It's the best you will ever see. We like it here, we all agree. To her, we pledge our loyalty. Our school is named for a famous man who brought back plants from many a land. In our school, his name lives on. We follow his motto, push on, push on. She died at their summer home in Vienbray on September 24, 1962. Marion did. Their ashes were mixed together and interred near those of Alexander and Mabel Bell on the mountain behind the great house. The descendants of both the Grosvenor and Fairchild families continue to gather at Vienbray to this day. Thank you. I guess there's uh, time for a couple of questions. Absolutely, plenty of time for questions. Yeah. The last, sorry, yeah. the last place you mentioned is that in Canada. It's in Nova Scotia. Nova Scotia. Okay. Quite a ways away. Beautiful place, though. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, talk a little bit how you think of him as an epicure. I thought that was a really great. Question. Uh, you know. He was not a cook, and he didn't. I mean, I mean, I'm sure that he enjoyed the flavors of the of the places he went in the tropics. But his actual approach to cooking was was pretty direct. I think I was talking to Helene about it, and so he was not, uh, you know, a gourmet cook. Epicure in the wider sense. Oh, you mean an Epicurean? Yeah. Okay, so so I wrote an essay about uh, the Epicurean life, and so. Uh, Epicurus was, of course, a Greek philosopher that lived around the time of uh, Plato, and he, he had a radically different philosophy than Plato, and he, he believed that uh, the only way that you could know the truth was through your senses. You had to see, you had to observe. You could sharpen your senses, but the essence to living a good life was to have clear and direct sens sensory experience, perception of the world. Plato didn't think that was enough. You had to have the ideal of something that would guide your understanding of it. So it was beyond perception. So, <clears throat> but also Epicurus was a very strong believer in friendship and the value of friendships and good conversation. And he believed that if you followed these precepts of uh, perception and friendship and everything, that you would, you would arrive at a state of what he called ataraxia, which was a, was a state of, uh, of being at peace with the world a non-attachment of a certain kind. And I believe that there's a lot of similarities in David Fairchild's life. He was not a philosopher. He didn't, I don't know if he even read it. He might have read Epicurus. I mean, he read, he read widely, but uh, he, never, he never said it anyway, as far as I know. But it just seemed like uh, it was a life that was in the, in the spirit and the tradition of Epicurus. So I wrote this essay about him at the end. Yes. <laughs> The idea of a uh, foreign plant introduction would have a sort of mixed reputation today. What, what was the view of it in those times? Uh, was he, uh, you know, an elitist about global plants and like well, the best ones? Well, there's, two, th th there's two things. First of all, um, there's a danger that a foreign plant that's introduced can become invasive, mm -hmm. of which we got plenty of examples all over the country. Every place you go, it's like, wow. There's something called uh, garlic mustard. It's up north. It's down here now. So it's, it grows right in the end, sorry, take over. So, oh, sorry, okay, so I do that. <laughs> so, uh, you know, at the time he was introducing plants, so I would say that the fact that an invasive plant could be ecologically damaged to an intact and normal ecosystem, 
was not well appreciated. I mean, uh, invasive plants were like plants that would be weeds that would invade a cropland, which is a disturbed system. So that, that understanding wasn't there. Um, and a lot of the concern in those days was more about insects than it was about plants. But none, nonetheless, he did introduce plants uh, through this section that became invasive. And we have a couple of them in South Florida, although it's a very small percentage of the ones that he introduced. There was a story about, you know, the introduction of the, uh, of the Japanese cherries, which he was uh, very important in, a lot of opposition to it. And the first batch of cherries that came in were just full of, uh, of pests, disease, and insects, and so forth. And the second came, that came in seemed to be all right. But as a result of that, there was a, uh, that came through from the east, there was a, a moth that is still a very damaging pest to uh, cherry crops in the middle Atlantic states today. So there is, there, that is an issue. And he, he was aware of it. He wrote about it in his essay on plant introduction. That he had, had to be careful. Look at plants in introduction gardens and don't let them get out. So I would say that he was concerned about it, but he, didn't, he underestimated the, the ecological damage that invasive plants could, could cause. Yes? I, I, I read in your book, David, I, I noted that, um, that uh, David Fairchild um, try, would try anything. I think the only thing he would never, he never attempted to taste was, I think he said, dog. But other than that, <laughs> you know, that he he would he would try anything. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and I think Barbara Lathrop probably ate dog, but he wouldn't eat durian. He said, he wouldn't he wouldn't eat durian. This is a, a you know an interesting tropical fruit that's an acquired taste, which I've acquired. I've acquired the taste for it. But uh, yeah, he ate just about everything. He would try just about everything. He ate all kinds of insects, and stuff that we would find really offending, which he describes in his article in his article in the Atlantic magazine. That was his experience. Yes, David. Yeah, on, on the subject of the, the exotic introduction of exotic plants, Jennifer Testhammer, the deputy director of the Deering Estate, was telling me that, that they have a letter there from Charles Deering to somebody. I'm not who, sure who he was at the date, but uh -huh. he was he was criticizing in that period David Fairchild for introducing all these exotic plants. They knew each other. Yeah. They were they were they they, they they interact with each other. So he could have written the letter to him for all I know. Not sure. Yeah. But uh, I, don't, I think it was not widely introduced, the, the potential damage of, of exotic plants in, in an ecological sense. And we, now we know it's pretty serious, so yeah. Well, thank you all for coming. All right. Okay, so if there are no more questions, uh, and a reminder for our internet audience at home, if you tuned in late, uh, you can call the number on your screen, purchase a copy of the book. We'll have Mr. Lee sign it for you, and we'll ship it to you wherever you are in the United States for free. For those of you here in the house with us, we have the, count the book for sale at the counter over there. David's going to be signing over there to the t at the table to the left of the screen. And uh, that was so interesting. Why don't we give Mr. Lee another hand? Thank you very much. Thank you.